Jay here for Stretford Paddock and this is the Tier 1 Transfer Podcast. Joining me as usual is my co-host Ronaldo Brown. Ronaldo, how are we doing? I'm doing alright. Um, still got the resort hangover, obviously. <laughs> you could, if you can remember, I would know it out. I thought I got angry when United <laughs> lose, but Ronaldo hey, took it to nah. a new level. If you watch the watch along, nah, all the review... Was... There was smoke coming out of his ears, man. I feel it was like, raging. I feel like at a personal level, that Mate, is the issue. Listen, it was difficult to take, but yeah, we'll, but... we'll move on <laughs> from the FA Cup semi-final and get into the uh, the transfer news. <laughs> now, normally what we do is obviously we go through the, the, the transfer stories, the tier one journalists, what they're talking about. But we're going to have something a little bit different later on. We're going to be speaking to Darren Lewis from the Mirror and from CNN because we know that Black Lives Matter yeah. has been sort of embraced by football and it's become... Race has always been an issue in football, obviously, but it's become more of an issue of late. And we've seen uh, players, obviously, taking the knee. We've seen um, presenters wearing badges. We've we've seen racism still. still. We've seen people reacting. We've seen sort of banners, white lives matter, yeah. all lives matter, and all that nonsense. So we spoke to Darren Lewis about that. So we're going to be um, chatting to him. We spoke to him recently, so you'll see when me and Ronaldo spoke to Darren Lewis, who's obviously one of the more prominent black football writers in the country about what he thinks about Black Lives Matter and football and racism in football and what can be done to tackle it. But first of all, we're going to get into the transfer news. Now, when it comes to tier one transfer news, Ronaldo, you saw a story this yeah. morning. Um, it was from yesterday, actually, it basically came to like more like prominently or more properly. I did kind of mention it earlier in the, in the news, but um, Mohamed Boufazi, which is a tier one source mainly in France, but he's a tier one transfer kind of specialist, so to speak, or journalist. So he's, it's a really credible source. We've been hearing stuff about Jadon Sancho for what, months? Yeah. Feels like years. It's daily. Feels it? like years. Yeah. And you, you, you're kind of trying to weed, a lot, like weed out or what's, what bit of news should I take or what, like what's more credible and what's just like people just trying to kind of jump on the fact that it's a bit of a story and a bit of a name. Yeah. And this is not one of them guys. Mohamed Bufazi, basically team reporter, reported that from Sky Sports Germany, noted that Sancho is homesick and he definitely has heard, we don't know where from, but he has reported that Jalen Sancho is definitely pushing for a move out of Dortmund, which doesn't seem like an, ex an extensive or exhaustive kind of quote or kind of revelation, so to speak, but it's about who said it and the fact that he's got such credibility means that there is actually weight to it and it does bode well for United's ambitions to do obviously sign him. Um, but what do you think, Jay? Well, obviously with things like that, as you mentioned, yeah. you know, you did the news yeah. from Old Trafford earlier today and you were talking about it. Yeah. I've been there and the Jaden Sancho story just keep going on and on and on and you have to sort of weed out, as you mentioned, what's credible and the certain narratives that keep cropping up, the certain stories that keep cropping up and the, the recent one is that Sancho does want to move and he's mm. pushing for that. Now, we're not talking about pushing in the terms of He's expected to go on strike or anything drastic, but he's let Dortmund know he wants to leave, sort of thing, and they know he's unhappy staying there. He seems now is the time for him to move on. So the the sort of the problem with United and Jaden Sancho coming over doesn't seem to me to be Sancho's desire. Mm. I think he'll come. I think that's not an issue. Mm. I think the problem is the the price tag. I think Dortmund won 110 million has been quoted roughly, give or take. Mm. I think the CEO, the or not the CEO, sorry, the sporting director, um, he came out and said that not long ago, that's around the, the sort of figure they're looking at. United, it's been reported, aren't willing to quite match that. We're, depending on who you believe, it's roughly around the £80 million pound mark, although some have quoted as £50 million. That, that was sort of, that seemed to be nonsense. So, we know Sancho, or we believe Sancho wants to come. It's just up to United, and I don't think United can rely on him to push it. They've got to come, on, come in with a bid that's going to get Dortmund sort of happy to, to move forward. Yeah, and we've, and we've seen that um, we're not really in a position to kind of, well, obviously the situation with, with Liverpool being so far ahead, with us being a top four, like periphery kind of side, which is not where United need to be. And obviously the current squad of players starting 11, maybe not squad depth wise, which is probably the main reason why we do need to get the transfers in, is um, we need to add star quality in the wherever it is probably what we've seen recently maybe even in the defense we've got question marks over our keeper we've still got question marks over our um two center backs well recently which is kind of difficult to say because we've gone so many games unbeaten but there's um you can still see these frailties there there's not that kind of solidified confidence that you're just going to get nailed in 
and Beckenbauer performances every single. Beckenbauer, <laughs> Boris Becker performances against yes. Chelsea. Never no, mind Beckenbauer. So, um, but yeah, you're right. Get Jaden in because obviously we've seen a drop off when when you you take you start off with Greenwood, you start off with Martial, and you start off with Rashford, and you are relying on an 18 year old, which as we do see with youngsters, they're the ones that are talented that obviously got special moments in him, but they can struggle with consistency. That's part of growing up as a footballer. And um, we can't, at this point, expect to rely on him extremely heavily, game in, game out, even when it comes to next season. He does need to play a huge role because he's frankly too good. But Because um, obviously I'm saying that because people were kind of feeling like, oh, Mason Greenwood's kind of rise may lessen the need for us to get Jaden, but I don't think that is the case at all. You want as many star players in as many positions as possible, and you want to be able to adjust and change the teams without it resulting in the performance that you've seen against Chelsea, where we just completely fall off a cliff and you look half the side when you just change one or two players. And that is not how you win trophies. You need strength in depth everywhere, all over the pitch. And even if it's, I'm not saying you've got to have Pogba and then another Pogba on the bench right behind him, just someone that's still got a bit of quality but can still do a serviceable job where you don't go from a top four side with your starting eleven to a mid-table or upper mid-table Europa League side when you don't have them playing. That's basically how I see it. So when it comes to the likes of should we get Jaden, should we pay the money? Pay the money because you'll likely get back your investment when you're competing better, you're finishing higher on the table and you get Champions League again definitively. And obviously... Um, shirt sales, revenue, etc. But obviously, I'm not here to speak about economics. No, you know, so. I know you're not. But that yeah. is, that, <laughs> like, you know, we have to be honest, and that yeah. plays a, a, a big part in it. Obviously, you've played football at the very top level. How much of a, a sort of a, a help do you think it'd be for, for Mason Greenwood as well, or how much do you think it could help his career having that? Not just that competition for places, but the, the, the team not be so reliant on him because we saw it on Sunday where he didn't start. Dan James came in. Didn't have the best game, no disrespect to but he was very quiet. Yeah. And it almost adds a little bit more pressure to Mason Greenwood because now you're looking forward thinking, oh, we need to start him every game. How much do you think that helps him if he, someone like Sancho comes in and there's another option there so it's not all about him, but there is a bit of competition as well? I've heard a, a quite a few people mention what usually happens to young stars, especially in English football, where it's demanding. It's so demanding on the player. It's demanding mentally. Just be having a football career generally is. It's, obviously, everyone thinks it's a very luxurious industry. But it's um, one of the most demanding professions that you can ever be a part of. It's not all like happy, go lucky. You've got you've got to have willpower. You've got to have like strong mental capacity. You've got to be able to. It's you need to put your best foot forward every single day, and um, when you're demanding that of someone that's so young, it does play a part. And experience does matter a lot. And what I was going to start off by saying is, with the likes of Wayne Rooney. Michael Owens, when they basically did the Greenwood-esque of just starting off firing from young, 17, 18, even the likes of Phil Walcott, um, you, can, well, you can burn them out quite quickly. They don't have the, quite the longevity of career as some other players may have. Think about it. What, I've just mentioned three names and how their careers kind of tailed off towards the end. The, the, yeah, certainly the latter two, you know, in, yeah. and, and Phil Walcott especially. Yeah. I mean, he went to the World Cup at 17. Yeah. He didn't go back again. He's what, that's what I'm saying. It's just too much, too young, and then they just burn out. They, it's, um, they build up the miles, and then by the time they're like 27, 28, they're always what you think is going to be their prime. They're on the way down because they've already been playing for like 10 years at the top level. So... Um, We've got to be careful with Greenwood, he's got to manage, we've got to manage him. And the only way to manage him is if you have got a top, top quality player who can start and not put the pressure on him. He can still be bedded in. And um, and if he's if he carries on with this form, then he can, he used to say he can't break in. It might motivate him to do better, to break in, saying, I don't care that you've paid 110 million for Jaden Sancho. I don't care what that Rashford's had the best season that he's ever had. I don't care that Marshall's had his best season that he's ever had yeah. at United. I'm good enough to break into that, and that can only be good for United, surely. Hundred yeah. percent. Couldn't agree more with all yeah. that. And you know, you like you say, we don't want to uh, burn Mason Greenwood out, and we should be challenging for yeah. the very top. Like you say, not just settling for the, the fringes of uh, the top four. Um, you've seen a story as well from um, Sam, Sam Lee because you were talking about the defence. A defender we were linked with was Nathan Ake. Now Sam Lee covers Manchester City for the Athletic, but he is, you know, he's considered a very reputable journalist. He has good sources at that club. 
what's he said about Nathan Aki? Because apparently, you know, he, he could be going to... Yeah, Sam Lee from yeah, The yeah. Athletic, as, um, who covers Man City, and he's a fairly reliable source, as as we know, um, has said that there was an interest in Bournemouth's um, Nathan Aki, what you just said, from City. Yeah, yeah. Which, which, which the sort of the thing is with that the yeah. reason I mean obviously because he was he was also linked to us as well so it's well, like that's it and you've just yeah. been talking about the defence and the, the problems there and, and you remember a few weeks ago there was the, the footage of Ronaldo uh, Ronaldo <laughs> of, um, of Solskjaer saying to Nathan Aki after the game it seems, he seemed to say something and people were, were claiming that he said good luck we need a left footed centre back or something or look after yourself we need a left footed centre back yeah. almost insinuating that United were going to go in for Nathan Aki now Oli was asked about this and he Quash these rumours. He said, "Listen, I've got seven centre backs. I don't need a centre back." But Nathan Aki is obviously, despite Bournemouth's problems, he's a mm. very good player. Him going to City, if that happens, because Sam Lee says the interest is real. What do you make of that? Do you think that's United missing out? Does that worry you at all that City is strengthening, getting that player in, or you're not really bothered? Um, don't get me wrong, Nathan Aki, I think he's a good player, etc. But playing for Bournemouth, relegation threatened team. Um, is he really outstanding enough to where he's gonna he's gonna elevate a team like United or City, or is or is it a bit of a, is it going to be a bit of a lateral move where they're pretty much he's on par with Lindelof and Maguire or is it's not like you can say he's definitively better than both or even anywhere as good as him. It's just the terms of as the United fans and as myself kind of see it as there's an bit of an absence in kind of style of centre back maybe do you think Maguire and Lindelof are too similar or they don't there's not enough pace in the centre back areas I think that's one of the main reasons why they wanted to get Nathan Aki so I think it's just more for style you've got he offers balance it's left he's a left-sided centre back and he's quicker but um as for being overall better than what we've got at the moment at centre back I'm not sure about that I think that'd just be a lateral move and if he goes to City I don't really see how he'd elevate them as well. Obviously, he's better than what they've been playing there, because if this, that's the main reason why they've um, had such a subpar season to their standard is their centre back area. So maybe out of pure desperation or team need, as you would say in the American sports, team need. Team need. Yeah, um, they would probably they might as well get Nathan Aki, but I don't know if it would scare me. If City got Nathan Aki, to be honest with you, I feel I even I mean I'm not not here to talk about Man City, but it's something that affects yeah. United. I, I completely agree. I think it'd be a sideways move for United, and even you know if John Stones goes out and Nathan Aki goes in, I know the two t- different types of defenders, but yeah. I don't see that as a massive improvement. I just see it's sort of more of the same, almost levels. Yeah. Um, so um, I mean, listen, it looks like Nathan Aki isn't coming to Old Trafford. Quite a reliable source there says. The interest from City's real. Personally, I think if City are after mm. him, they'll get him yeah. because they're going to spend money this summer. Yeah. They've had the cast ruling. They've got money to spend. They're finishing one of the worst title defences ever. Um, so they're, they're going to want to rebuild. So that um, that transfer could very well happen, but I'm mm. with you, Ronnie. It's not something mm. that makes me sort of keeps me up at night. Um, moving on, as I said earlier, recently we spoke to Darren Lewis about racism in football, about Black Lives Matter, how football has embraced it and about why there's a, a lack of, of black managers and even black football writers. You're a journalist, yeah. I'm a journalist, and the, 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 there often isn't many black football journalists around in this country. So we asked him all about that. Here's the interview with Darren Lewis. Check it out. So Jay here from Stretford Paddock. This is the Tier 1 Transfer Podcast. And joining us today is Darren Lewis from The Mirror. Darren, Black Lives Matter uh, has been in the news a lot lately. And obviously it's a campaign that's been embraced by football on and off the pitch. What have you made of the way football has got behind the campaign? It's a tricky one because, on the one hand, you know, the attention that's been given to it is fantastic. But at the moment, it's only a messaging campaign and it needs to go beyond that. You know, there are only so many times the players can take a knee, there's only so many badges that can be worn, there's only so many Black Lives Matter advertising hoardings that we see. What we need to see, and I'm sure I've seen you say that many times and lots of people are of the same opinion, we now need to see what football is going to do. And I don't mean down the line in a year's time. I don't mean in terms of audits, reports, panels, whatever else. I mean in terms of real substantive change. Also, I don't just mean on the pitch. I mean off the pitch as well. You know, the broadcasters who cover 
football. You know, where is the change at the top of their boardrooms in their leadership teams? Because we are covering sport and we're all in the sport industry. But if you go into a press room, for example, the black people are generally the ones who are serving the food and the people who are white, but most of them are the ones with the laptops. Um, and that's just not for football. That's in lots of other industries as well. But the bottom line is that we still have a situation where the Black Lives Matter campaign is still a messaging campaign and it needs to be more than that. Definitely. Like, kind of extending on from that, what do you feel like can actually be done at the top to kind of help with that? Give people jobs. <laughs> None of it is that difficult. All of it is an easy fix. Make some more room around the table. Um, the next time you have an opportunity, you know, everyone, you know, the interesting thing is people say, well, do they actually apply as though black people are a different species? You know, as though there's a fascination around us. It's like the white people are the ones who get up in the morning and go to work, put the suit on, and the black people are the ones who sit at home watching daytime TV. You know, I mean, I've been on, you talk about black managers that do they take their badges, which I, I still, even now, get asked whenever I do a story about the lack of black managers. I was on the UEFA, um, I went on one of the courses for the UEFA license uh, a few years ago, I think two or three years ago at St. George's Park. I was there with a small number of journalists who were helping the candidates with their media training. And let me tell you, black people were well represented on the course. You know, black ex-players take their badges. They get the qualifications because a number of years ago, when people wanted to defend the lack of black managers, that's what they would say. Do they go and get their qualifications? Get your qualifications and you can moan. So they went and they got their qualifications and you still have only five black managers in the English game. There are any number of people throughout the game who have qualifications to do a job in administration, in leadership. If you look at, for argument's sake, Les Ferdinand, he is universally respected, highly qualified. He's done his time. He is a fantastic administrator. Why is he not involved at the top of the FA? Why is there no place for him so that when black players look up, like Sterling says, if I look at the top of the FA, I don't see anybody I can relate to. They could relate to Les Ferdinand. Why is he not there? So when you say to me, what can be done? It's not difficult. You don't need, I keep saying it, you don't need audits, you don't need reports, just give them jobs. I mean, we, we've seen a sort of a variation of the, the Rooney rule in the Football League, but we know there's, there's loopholes. I mean, I think if you, if you don't have a shortlist, and you just interview one candidate, then you don't have to interview a black candidate. Um, what do you make of the, that sort of the Rooney Rule idea? Is that an option if it's done properly? No, because look, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of the Rooney Rule, if I'm honest. And I know a lot of black managers and potential managers aren't fans of it as well. Because in an ideal world, what you would want is for people to have the the breadth of you know scope, if you like, uh, and uh, capacity to think outside the box enough to know that there is black talent and there is white talent and all of it should be judged on the same level on its merits but i think what we have in it in football is closed thinking uh, so somebody knows someone else who knows someone else who will be able to put a call in and what we have to do is step outside of that closed thinking um, and i certainly think that that will change the more administrators we have so we have for example the onboard scheme where black ex-pros go and they get their qualification in administration so that they can not just go for management jobs but they can go for technical director jobs chief executive jobs jobs that give them power to make decisions over who they appoint if you have that then you have more of a chance of a technical director or a chief executive saying to an owner we should maybe look at him for this role or him for this role but at the moment we still do have close thinking and the Rooney rule isn't going to solve that because we've had it for some time some people ignore it some people to be fair 
they abide by it, but other people bypass it because they already have the candidates that they want in mind and they go straight away for them. When you've seen like black managers in the Premier League, it's usually through like caretaker roles, like for doomed or relegation threatened teams. Um, do you think this kind of has like a detrimental effect on like the way chairmen kind of look at black managers in general when they kind of apply to be offered the job? Uh, yes and no. I think I think it, it's almost a perfect storm, really. And we've seen lots of people talk about this, but I think Les Ferdinand talks about it. Uh, very well when he says, look, when I see players being interviewed, I don't want to see them talking about if I didn't go into football, I would have done something negative. I would have gone into crime. I would have done, because they aren't your only life choices. You know, footballers have a responsibility to present themselves in the right way so that they don't crystallize negative opinions that people who are from a different world, if you like, to them will have about them. But at the same time, you know, we, we have had the debate, I won't go into it again, but the debate about the way black players are characterised sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes in commentary. And uh, then you get the abuse that players suffer all the time and the fact that those players are, are kind of forced to relive that trauma again and again and again. Um, it's almost like a perfect storm of things coming together. And so sometimes... Insular custodians of football clubs don't see black ex-pros as an option when they should. Um, and I think that we have to kind of break that perception. And if it means having that debate about language, which we're having at the moment, then we should do that. If it means um, us in the media not going down that route of what would you do if you weren't a player kind of thing, then, you know, the media's got a role to play as well. Um, there are all sorts of things that we need to look at as part of this, because I think it's a whole game solution to, to this lack of representation. And that's not to accuse anybody or to criticise anybody. It is to say that if we all, and I think we all do want to change the situation, then we all have to play our part. Obviously, you're talking about you do want to see change, but on the other hand, do you actually expect change to happen? I don't expect anything now um, from our game because I think that we've seen a lot of moments like the one that we can see at the moment um, where we've been positive or, or, or optimistic about what we think is going to happen only to be let down. I mean, if you think about, if you go back to Sterling 18 months ago and there was a big kind of wailing and gnashing of teeth December 2018 and then six months on, more racist abuse, six months after that, more racist abuse. Uh, if you look at the situation involving Jonathan Lecco, where he waits seven months for a resolution to his uh, allegation of racism uh, and at the end of it, he says, I'll never report racist abuse again because that by the end of it, I was made to feel like the victim. And you see that very little has changed. So we've seen moments like this before. I certainly have over the last 20 years that I've been working for the Daily Mirror. Um, and it's left me aware of the fact that no matter how optimistic you get, there's still going to be a, a, a difficult... Change is very slow, very, very slow. Um, and I, my concern is that it will continue to be slow because I think what I've seen so far has left me really with a pessimism going forward. Danny, I mean, you touched on it earlier um, in terms of sort of black and non-white journalists. I mean, I've been in press conferences, Champions League press conferences, where the only non-white people in the room are the player who's up for interview and myself. Um, what do you make of the number of, of black football journalists? Do you think there's enough and you think we can do something about that or what can we do about that? We've got some excellent black football journalists at the moment. Adrian Kajumba works for the Daily Mail. Sammy Mockbell um, also works for the Daily Mail. Uh, Carl Anker, uh, Ryan Conway or Shane Thomas will work for The Athletic. Um, 
uh, Sammy, uh, forgive me, Sachin Akrani works for The Guardian. There are a number, there are others as well. But having said all of that, you're right, we still do have situations where in some press conferences, there are one or maybe even not black journalists. Now, I know the Black Collective of Media and Sport are doing a terrific job in uh, attracting and attracting potential young journalists and taking them to newsrooms around the country and around London to, to ensure that they get experience, whether it's broadcast, radio or print, you know, of meeting people, seeing how they work, seeing what they do, uh, taking numbers, taking email addresses, and hopefully with the aim in maybe five, ten years' time of those kids getting a foothold in the industry. Um, but again, you're talking about down the line. And certainly with a print industry that isn't recruiting, it's digital really that's doing the recruiting rather than print. Uh, there are obviously obvious difficulties there. But I think I certainly think that what we're going to have to do is get a situation where digital is going to be the platform where we have a greater representation of young black journalists. Would you say from your like own experience in, within the industry that you've kind of experienced your own kind of prejudice or or setbacks of the, of the like on your way up? I suppose my I started life as a news journalist, so my my way up, if you like, was was a bit different to um, some other people's way into the industry. I mean, the Daily Mirror, right from day one have been excellent with me in terms of the faith that they've shown in me and the, um, the space that they've given me to be able to develop my own voice and to be able to speak about issues that I certainly would say I, in the early days, nobody wanted to speak about. And sometimes I'd write something and feel like the only person who has seen or heard racist abuse at a match. Um, what's terrific now is that we've got the media who are a lot younger and a lot more willing to call stuff out than they ever were. But certainly in those first four or five years, it was as if I was watching a different game when I'd go to matches and hear racist abuse thought the unwillingness to call it out because it would be he said, she said, it would be too much aggravation um, for a variety of reasons. The unwillingness to call out the racism meant that most players literally had to put up with it because they knew that they wouldn't have allies in the media. Sad times. Um, well, I mean, we've seen, when it comes to sort of online abuse, we've seen some abuse recently that the players like Zaha, McGoldrick, um, Ian Wright, of course, have received online. And they've highlighted that. They've shown that. They've reposted it. They've took screenshots and, and shown that. What do you make of the fact that players are showing it and they're, they're, they're not just saying, you know, ignoring it and saying that, OK, you know, this is part and parcel of the game, whatever. They're saying, look, this is what, what is happening. This is the sort of stuff we have to put up with. I think you have to call it out. You have to call it out. Um, I've asked this of other people, but my, their answer, sorry, and their answer would be my answer. You have to call it out. Because if you don't, then people get deluded into believing that we have come a long way. But the only, basically... We, they threw bananas and stuff in the 60s and 70s, and now they're basically sending banana emojis and worse in uh, 2020. So you have to call it out. You have to put pressure on the people who are claiming. If you look at Instagram's um, Twitter feed, one of their tweets basically says that we stand against all forms of racism. And yet you can still go on to Twitter and send a racist direct message to a black footballer or a black person. And so clearly that message doesn't re mean that much. So listen, I, I was going to say I don't know what you do about online abuse, but I do know, you know, you can put pressure on the uh, social media companies to be able to take action just as they do with people who violate their uh, rules and regulations, but they don't do it anywhere near often enough, which is why players are still going through it. Um, the only other solution is to come off it, but why should you have to come off it? Why should the social media companies not deal with it as they should? Um, for a lot of people, 
there is a resignation. What are you going to do? But I think we all really should be coming together to get the social media companies to do more. You, you touched on it earlier about some of the, the sort of the treatment that Raheem Sterling had, for example. We've seen it here at United with some of the, the treatment in the past that players like Paul Pogba or even Marcus Rashford have had, especially with, with Rashford and Sterling in particular. I mean, they've done so much sort of positivity lately that you've seen so much good press around them. Do you think that could be a sort of, I don't know what to say, a turning point, but a step in the right direction? Because it's almost like now if certain people or certain journalists or whatever or newspapers are going down that road that they've been down in the past, people are going to call them out on it because of the so much positivity around players like like the ones I mentioned, like Sterling and Rashford and others. Um, well, the thing about Sterling and Rashford is that they are high-profile players doing good things. Um, it's very hard to write negative things about players who are doing good things. And generally, um, the negativity is generally in the front pages rather than the back pages as, uh, as much as I've seen um, but you know when, when Sterling talked about Instagram posts it's no secret that journalists wrote themselves pieces suggesting that maybe they'd used unconscious bias when they had written pieces previously so you know that's not my opinion that, that that's their own words, both on TV shows and in print as well. But here's the thing. It's more about the players that are not A-list players. It's more about the players that don't play in the Premier League. It's more about the players that aren't uh, are fashionable, who don't generate those column inches. They're the ones who really we should be focusing on, who don't score hat-tricks every week or change government policy. They're the ones who get the rough end of the wedge because you still see that when they complain about their treatment, people aren't as willing to listen as they are to your Pogba's, your Lukaku's, your Rashford's and your Sterling's. Uh, people are more willing, actually, to dismiss them. I mean, if you look at, for example, somebody like Danny Rose, Danny Rose, for me, speaks superbly on a number of issues. And he says stuff that is uncomfortable to listen to, but absolutely the kind of thing that we should be listening to. And he is characterised as a troublemaker, as a moaner. Oh, if you're going to leave football as soon as you get to the end of it, you might as well go now. Do you actually like football? Now, I'm sorry, but Danny Rose has every right to raise the fact that he's operating in a game that doesn't protect black footballers. He's got every right to point out that there is no point taking your badges because as hard as you work to get your badges, football doesn't want to give you a, a job as a manager. Why? How do you know that? Because you look at the numbers now, 91 clubs in this country, five are managed by people in black or brown. He's got every right to raise those things. But the point is that people don't want to hear those things. And with the people that they don't want to hear those things from, it's okay to characterize them as troublemakers, as moaners, as disruptors, as people that you don't want to be around. But I'll tell you, Danny Rose speaks the kind of truth that football needs to hear and still doesn't want to listen to. Definitely. Do you kind of think in the aspect of like managerial prejudice towards like the lack of black manager managers represented at the top level, do you kind of think it's because it's harder to kind of quantify like how good a manager is. Because if you've got good black players, you can kind of see visually the effective, the quality, the miles better than someone else that may be white. But when you've got a black manager or you've got a white manager, it's kind of hard to quantify. Do you think no, that comes into I don't agree it? with that. I don't agree with that. They all play football at the highest level. They all win things at the highest level. They all show that they're leaders and strategists. They all play good, creative football. Um, they all should. They all should have the ability to be as bad as each other or as good as each other. I don't think that there's any distinction whatsoever. Um, if I look at some of the players that have finished playing, the creative players, the defensively aware players, the leaders who have come out of the game. You look. If you look at people like Sol Campbell, people deride Sol Campbell, and yet. He went to Macclesfield and he saved them from an impossible position. He went to Southend 
and he did well there and then he left because South End couldn't give him the resources that he needed. Not because he was a bad manager or because he'd done a bad job. But people don't want to look at those things. People want to look at the negative aspects of his job. They don't want to look at the fact that Paul Lynch saved Macclesfield from an impossible position. They don't want to look at the fact that, yeah, there may have been jobs where things didn't go so well, but there are jobs that where things didn't go well for any number of white managers, but they are still in the mix for other jobs. And when jobs come up, they're still in the betting, for example, for those jobs. We have to ask ourselves why it's okay for certain managers to be recycled time and again. But if you're black and you fail a couple of times, that's it, you're done. That's that's the problem that football has. Um, and I'm thankful enough to be in a position where I don't have to worry about the ramifications about being honest about that because I don't think football is honest enough about the fact that there is still uh, a barrier a very, very strong barrier keeping capable ex-players from getting jobs in management. Um, just finally, Darren, before you go, it'd be only right that I ask you a, a United question. Um, what do you make of the, the signings that Oli Gunnar Solskjaer has made this season and how they've fitted into the United team? I think United are as exciting a side as I can remember certainly since Alex Ferguson left. Um, I, you know what's interesting? You asked me about the signings. And actually, I'm more taken by the job that Ole has done with Brandon Williams, at left back, who's coming to the side and has performed well and looks as though he could be a regular fixture in that side for years to come. The job that he's done bringing through Mason Greenwood. I was talking to somebody today who was saying he'd rather United stay with Mason Greenwood and develop him and nurture him and give him the game time than go and get Harry Kane for big money. Because Mason Greenwood, he is just, and this is my opinion here, and I tweeted it the other day, I think he's a fireball of anticipation and composure and ruthless finishing. He, he is just an edge-of-the-seat player who can produce a goal out of nothing. And the job that Oli's done nurturing him, bringing him on, keeping him in check, um, and then unleashing him. I mean, now he is demanding to be put into the first team, and he's responding to that as well. Bruno Fernandes, no-brainer, terrific player. And, you know, the whole Pogba situation, what's the, what's, the, what's the connection between Pogba doing well in this United side and Pogba doing well at Juventus? He's surrounded by quality. When you put quality around a player like Popper, you get the best out of them. And now, if you're a United fan, you go to a game with your chest puffed out and you've got a bit of anticipation and excitement going into it because you know that you've got a group of players that are going to deliver. I would, if I'm allowed to, um, suggest that <laughs> if you bought a commanding centre-half to play alongside uh, Harry Maguire, I wonder if you need another midfielder as well. I know you've given the Matic a new deal, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to see some younger legs in midfield as well. And maybe a right-sided player as well. I mean, if William was available, you know, he'd, he'd give you some terrific class down that right side. I know he wants a longer deal than lots of clubs are prepared to, to give him, but if he's available and you could get him, I think you'd have a side that capable of challenging uh, for the title next season. Because then you'd have goals in the side, you'd have creativity in midfield, you'd have that defensive solidity. I know you recently you've dis conceded a couple of goals, but overall you've actually not been that bad since Boxing Day last year. But you still do have that capacity for a quick player to sorry about that, um, <laughs> to take advantage. Um, I'll just do that bit again. Uh, I still do think that um, if you look at the side now and you go right through the side in attack, you're very strong. In midfield, you've got that balance between Pogba and Fernandez. At the back, though, defensively, you still do have a mistake in you. And I think that if you can address that, if you can get somebody who can come in and really give you the kind of leadership that Liverpool have with Van Dijk, that City had with Kompany, um, I think you'll really, really be strong contenders 
uh, for challenging at least for the title De Gea's class I can't believe that there is even a debate about Henderson coming in to replace him I still think that with a good side and you get him back on his day he's far better than Henderson I think he's got a, a bit of uh, learning to do for me De Gea all day long but I think yeah if you're asking me what I think of the side at the moment I think they're terrific How much more exciting do you feel like Jalen Sancho would be to the team if we was be able to add him in the summer? I'm already on the edge of my seat with United at the moment, so I'd probably fall off it if Jaden Sancho was to arrive. Um, but, you know, again, he's quality. He's quick. He's composed. In combination with the other players that you've got in that forward line, he'd be terrific, but it'd cost a hell of a lot of money, and I don't know if United are willing to pay that money, given the concerns around football at the moment. I know that his club won probably close to £100 million. Now, to be fair, Bayern Munich wanted a similar amount for Leroy Sané. Uh, sorry, City wanted a similar amount for Leroy Sané and they ended up getting around half that. So um, it may well be that Dortmund are being unrealistic, but um, certainly if he was gettable, then he would absolutely improve that Manchester United. So I think we're all agreed about that. It's not really rocket science me saying that. But I think anyway, you know, you look at the team now and you enjoy watching Manchester United for the first time in many years. And um, yeah, I think they're going to be terrific. Darren, that was great chatting to you. I really appreciate you coming on the channel and, and the support you've given us. Um, it was really good stuff. And hopefully we'll be able to talk to you again soon. No problem. Thanks for having me on. Thanks a lot, Darren. Cheers, mate. Cheers. So that was Darren Lewis. Uh, he mentioned a lot there, yeah. Ronaldo. One of the things that he touched upon was um, the lack of black coaches. He mentioned certain names, you know, like Saul Campbell, Paul and so whatever. Yeah. But there is a, a dearth of, of black managers, in, not just in the Premier League, but in the Football League in general. Yeah. You've obviously played at a very high level. Was there? A, did you notice a lot of black coaches when you were playing? Was that something that you ever sort of thought of? Doesn't nah, seem so many. Or was that something you ever noticed at all? Honestly, um, I was, I've never been coached by a black coach. Um, and even by the, the period, the quite the extensive period I was at Liverpool's academy, I didn't see one black coach the whole academy. It's, it's... So I don't, I, not not from my knowledge, I can't remember one. But um, many will say it's nothing to do with race, and it, you just um, it's whether you're good enough or whether you're interested. There's more than enough black coaches out there or, or aspiring coaches. It's just as I was trying to say to Darren Lewis, I'm not sure whether he even understood. Um, they say um, when it comes to race in terms of football, it's more difficult to be kind of marginalised black players or kind of be have that built up prejudice because football is visual and you can clearly see who's better. So if you've got black football and you've got a white football and the black football is clearly better, you can't just play. It's it's they're not. It's more. It's easier to quantify to say. You're just going to play. You're going to play who's the better player, yeah. etc. And you're not going to base it on race. And if you did, if you did have that agenda, it'd be obvious to everyone. Everyone would be like, why are you playing him? He's not better than him. Yeah, yeah. So then it's kind of more obvious that there's like a, a suggestion that there's a racial connotation. Whereas with managers, um, it's ha actually very difficult. It's a player's game, football. So it's difficult to kind of quantify what, how effective a manager is or how good they're doing or how much effect they're having on a team because they're not the ones that are going out and playing. So you, it's kind of easier in the management field to kind of instill or keep prejudice within it in terms of making it to the top. So obviously we've seen it with the likes of Darren Moore, Chris Hewton, I've done decently well and still I've um, got sacked at really, really strange and odd times. And I think both of those that I've just said, they got sacked at times where they were, where he was finishing like 10th for Newcastle, 8th for Newcastle, Darren Moore, was a caretaker and did exceptionally well in the short space. Beat United, didn't they? Yeah. West Brom on his watch. Um, after we'd just beaten City, <laughs> came to, they came to Old Trafford almost yeah. doomed and got a result. No, I agree. Yeah. And then the following season, they were sort of in, in the, the mix for the playoffs. Yeah. And they sacked him and it was it was a bit of a shocker. Another thing we touched upon with Darren Lewis as well, which is a subject sort of close to my heart, was whether there's enough black football journalists. Yeah. Now, like with coaches, like with anything, you ask, well, why does it matter? And I think it matters because you want the people writing about sport, the people writing about football, the people managing football teams, to reflect the, the, the diversity in our sport, to, the, yeah. to reflect the fans, 
So, you know, I've been at, I mentioned it to Darren Lewis, I've been at press conferences where myself and the, the player who's been put up for interview are the only non-white people in the room. And you think, if I go to football, that's not the case. If I go to a game, that's not the case. So yeah. you just want it to be more diverse and reflect that. And that's what he spoke about. And it, there was sort of yeah. reasons to be positive there, wasn't there? Because he said there are more and more black football journalists, black sport journalists coming through. And you've seen it a little bit more than you perhaps did sort of five or ten years ago, which is a, a positive yes, thing. Is that, yeah, obviously, any progression is good progression, but um, it, it, it's just about getting to... Um, and even playing field, they do often say, you know, it's a bit deep that they say that equality is like, it's just a um, terrime or whatever. I think that's the term. Just sit, something like that. Don't quote me on it. Maybe Google it if I'm wrong. Let me know. Yeah, I'm sure you <laughs> yeah, will. Yeah, but um, saying that it's almost, there's a kind of like resignation where you think the world's like kind of too far gone in a certain direction in terms of like, like hierarchy. That's obviously not been, it's kind of instilled, you know, like institutionally in terms of like race. That um, maybe it won't ever be like even, completely even, but if we can get close to, then it, it's only right. It's only the human thing to do. Obviously, you want to be, as a black person in general, as any person of colour, when you want to aspire to do a job, you don't want, you shouldn't have to think about whether you are the right colour of skin to, to be successful in it. So no, um, Absolutely not. You know, that's right. Yeah. You know, you just want it to be a sort of level playing field yeah. and everyone to get the opportunities. And you want to see diversity in, in media. This is what, you know, a lot of the, yeah. black, the people who've been critical of Black Lives Matter or critical of that sort of, I think, don't see. It's not about making one set of people better than the other. It's about equality. It's yeah, about exactly. it, it being fair. That's what, what people are asking for, and I thought Dan Lewis did a great job of uh, sort of summing that up and explaining that, and, and some of the the challenges that, that football yeah. faces, which society faces as well. I was going to say, I don't think there's much more that needs to be said. I think Darren Lewis said. So it's quite a, quite a deep, yeah, quite a deep, quite a deep uh, tier one transfer podcast today. But uh, as we mentioned, uh, relevant or no, relevant at the t in the time. Yeah, so. we, it'd be remiss of us not to talk about that topic, yeah. um, and also you know we covered the transfer stories as well. The the, the tier one journalists are speaking about. Listen, get involved in the comments. Let us know what you think. Do you think Jaden Sancho is going to end up at Old Trafford? Would you like to see him at United? Is he the player that we need? Are you saddened to see that we may, may well be missing out on Nathan Aki if we were in for him? Is he a player that you want to see at Old Trafford? And do you think football is doing enough for equality and, and diversity or would you like to see bigger strides made? Ronaldo, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. You're the co-host. You're not joining me. Thanks for that. Um, make sure you check out Ronaldo. He's all over Twitter as well. <laughs> Psychic. Um, yeah, <laughs> acting like I'm the leader in this. Um, yeah. and, and as always on yeah. Stratford Paddock, we'll be having a daily paper talk from Old Trafford. We'll be having a podcast. We'll be previewing the um, the West Ham game that's coming up as well yeah. and we'll have the watch along hopefully Ronaldo on the next watch along won't be looking like he's ready to kill someone I've been Jay <laughs> that's been Ronaldo this has been the Tier 1 Transfer Podcast thanks for watching <laughs>